Thanks, Mace. Yeah, so welcome everybody. It's great to be back at the Dharma Collective. Even though I'm not there in person, I feel like I am. It's it's the space looks so wonderful. I wish I could be there in person, but I have to conserve my time because I am in a deadline finishing up the final edits of my book on the 21 Taras for the 21st century. <laughs> And uh, I'm having fun, but it's also a labor of love. I'm like, why did I think I wanted to do this? <laughs> but and then other times I feel really blessed, like, oh, I have the best job in the world. I love swimming in this ocean of Taras and thinking about them. Uh, but I, I'm hoping to get done at some point in October. I just, I need to move on with my life. <laughs> so um, I I, uh, I'm not there. I'm here in Berkeley in my house here in, in uh, Berkeley and enjoying the sunshine. I know it's going to be hot coming up soon. Where's everybody calling in from? Maybe people can send in a chat if they want to and say where you are. I also want to uh, acknowledge, uh, offer a land acknowledgement that I'm also not just here in Berkeley, but also on land that um, was inhabited and still is inhabited by the Liz John Ohlone people. And so maybe you can also take a moment and give your own internal land acknowledgement or chat it in. Land acknowledgement is always a good thing to know where you are and the history. So it's nice to see the chats coming in. Does any do you, do you guys know what indigenous land you're on? <laughs> Share that too, please. And if you don't, check it out. There's a website. It's called something like um, what is it called again? Land acknowledgement. It's from Canada. It's a map, a compiled map where you can type in your address and find out. Uh, what indigenous tribes live and, you know, stewarded the land before colonialism, at least if you're calling them from the United States or other places that have been colonized. It's good to remember that, you know, we take so many things for granted. Yeah, na nativeland.ca there, native-land.ca. Take a moment and, you know, um, find where you are in that type of dimension, that space, and, and acknowledge that in a appreciate it in the sense that uh, I think if we're all given a chance, we can help raise consciousness and widen our sphere of compassion and awareness rather than kind of more of the narrow view that I think a lot of us were raised with and education and so on. I think it's so much better now. Yes, Denise from Chumash Land, Bill from Coastal Miwok. I saw uh, Ute land um, in St. George, Geneva. I forgot you live in St. George. We used to drive de through there every summer on our way home from Taramandala back to Berkeley. And Taramandala also in southwest Col Colorado is in Ute land as well as on Ute, Ute land, uh, for which they do c try to be conscientious and pay definitely in kind of uh, forever uh, insufficient um, tax, but they do give money to the Ute tribes there. In any case, I wish you well, and we're here for a special evening. For those of you who are on Instagram and on the newsletter, you will have seen that we are doing Feeding Your Demons tonight. I see some new faces, and I think that you're probably here in part because of that. It's great to see some old new faces, too. <laughs> Hi, Bill. <laughs> Um, so hi everybody, I'm Chandra Easton, it's great to be here with you. I am sharing tonight this practice that I love so deeply. It's, like Mace said, can be a real buoy uh, for times of challenge. The Feeding Your Demons practice has been that for me, uh, just like Dharma can be, of course, and I love sharing it. I've, I think I got certified back in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, and I've been teaching it and doing one-on-one -on -one sessions ever since then, <clears throat> teaching groups, teaching trainings, and it never ceases to amaze me with how, um, how healing it can be in ways that are beyond prediction and unimaginable, quirky stories of imagery that comes up that people would never imagine or um, healing something that some, 
people have maybe turned away from for a long time, but finally turned to look at and start to feel uh, some sense of understanding and release from that so-called blockage. So I'll talk about Donglen, and I'm not Donglen, that is, Feeding Your Demons is like Donglen, actually, sending and receiving, but it's slightly different also. And I will tell you more about it before we dive into the practice, but let's take a moment and sit quietly. Settle in from our busy days. Make sure you're all muted. Take about a few minutes to meditate, just breathing into the body and releasing tension with the out breath. Really claim your space. It's almost like expand your bubble around you of, of serenity, of slowing down. It's like we're all joining the slow movement together consciously. Committing to slowing down so that we can be with whatever is here right now. Allow for the space to open and welcome perhaps some jagged edges or aspects of your day, of your week, of your life that might benefit from coming home. Mm, and if you're familiar with self donglen of the breathing in and out, welcoming in with the in-breath, that which you normally might be pushing away, and then breathing out, releasing, relaxing any struggle around that. Let it, let it rest in quietude and the warmth of your heart space. It's like that magic moment of turning to embrace the child who might be tantruming or turning to embrace your partner who just needs a hug. Sometimes we can do that for ourselves as well. Make that turn. Breathe it in and breathe out, releasing the tension and the resistance. And for the next minute or so, just now release any effort and just breathe in a sort of shamatha, mindfulness of the breath in the body, releasing distractions and planning and rumination with the out-breath. Claim your time here, claim your seat and slow it down. Slow down the mind, come home to the breath in the body. One way to slow down the mind is to just release the struggle, release the fixation. Now recalling that we come to Dharma very often from a deep calling of connection and wanting to heal ourselves, but also wanting to be of service in some way. So you may recall, if you wish, the heart of bodhicitta, spirit, the hope, the aspiration to heal and awaken so that we can be of benefit to others. If you wish, you can take your hands in this single-pointed intention mudra. This is called the single-pointed intention. 
meaning the two straight middle fingers, symbolize that focused aspiration to be a benefit to yourself and to others. And make a personal prayer. Thank you. How many people are here for the first time? <laughs> okay. How many people came knowing that we were doing Feeding Our Demons tonight? <laughs> Seems like maybe maybe most, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I'm seeing some digital hands clapping and thumbs up. Okay, looks like you're ready to go. <laughs> so, feeding your demons is a five-step practice that developed out of a more uh, traditional, old Tibetan practice from the 11th century, a woman teacher, which was not common at that time medieval, in medieval Tibet, to, in a sense, sort of develop her own style of dharma. And she developed this practice called chu, which means to cut or to sever meaning severing attachment to identity, to ego, to separation, to addiction, to the things that perhaps cause us suffering. And Machig Lavdrin, this 11th century teacher, created this new way of, of understanding a dharma it became very popular in Tibet. It infiltrated all the mainstreams of Tibetan Buddhism. And you have multiple Chud lineages. And she was inspired to develop this practice from a passage that she read in one of the famous Mahayana sutras called the Pragya Paramita Sutra. I believe she's reading the one in 8,000 lines. That's the first one, and later ones were... 10,000 lines, 25,000 lines, 100,000 lines. <laughs> but the classic first original, for the most part, scholars believe that that 8,000 lined sutra and those texts are like folios, you know, long, thin papers that model the old, uh, like banana leaves that were written on in the early days, unbound, right? So she was as a nun normally would on a daily basis, read through the sutras. It's a very important piece or part of a monastic education. Not only reading through to understand, but also to memorize. So many monks and nuns were required to memorize these long sutras, texts of words of the Buddha. And it, this one passage, I can't quote it verbatim, but essentially it stated that demons were not real things, but that we, were to, we should understand all forms of demons to be projections of the mind, aspects of our own awareness, and things that we project out into the world, or maybe we, we, we see signs or omens or dreams and we think there's some kind of external object out there or being coming to destroy us. So mm, Buddha was very much uh, an adamant teacher about all things traced back to the mind in terms of whether you're in samsara or nirvana, it's your state of mind. If you're liberated of clinging and ignorance, that's nirvana. If you are bound by ignorance and clinging, that's samsara. It's actually a state of mind. And so Machig Lavdrin had an epiphany and understood that. You know, it's one thing to read it, but it's another thing to really grok it. And that was the source of her uh, developed teachings called Ch, C-H-O, usually with an umlaut, 
Sometimes there's a D at the end. It's kind of a silent D that signals the end of the word is chopped, like cut at the end. Ch. And so I've learned that. I teach that. But also, like my teacher, Lama Tsultrim, learned it from her gurus, her teachers, whether it was Apo Rinpoche in the Kulu Valley back in the 60s or Namkai Norbu Rinpoche in the 80s in Italy. And she learned a few different chids. And after practicing with Namkai Norbu for, I don't know, five or ten years, he gave her, he asked her to start teaching it to Westerners. And so she started teaching this ancient ritual that's done with a bell and a drum, double-sided drum held <clears throat> in the right hand, and then a bell in the left hand, and you play them together and sing these beautiful haunting melodies, prayers of liberation and dedication and healing for others and self, for animals, the land. It's a, it's a really cool ritual. <laughs> it's really profound. And anyone can learn it, like you could learn it. And if you wanted to, and if you wanted to put the time in to really get the bell and the drum, not so easy. How many people have learned the chit? Yeah? Yeah, Tracy, are you practicing still or was it something a long time ago? <laughs> oh, oh well, sorry for the spontaneous question. It's not so easy when we're not in the room together. I guess it's set that people can't unmute themselves. Maybe we could change that, Noam, if possible. In any case, the point is, is that Lama Tsultrim found... Okay, thanks. Maybe can you do it now, Tracy? It might be fun to hear your voice come in. If you can. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. No. Oh. can't see you, but we can hear you. Uh, I, I have... Oh, no. <laughs> now both. Um, I... I, yeah, I've, I've explored this drum since I've learned it from you and awesome. and your teacher and your lineage. I've explored it and I love playing that drum. It's like, it's so, it's so hard and so fascinating and so complex. Mm, yeah. Like all the things, like at the same time, really simple, like the, the basics of it are like so foundationally simple. Yeah, 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 it just takes time. I think I had to take a chud retreat two or three times before I really felt like I was getting it. So mm -hmm. it, it it can, it can. that's not true for everybody, but I remember in the early days I had tendonitis, so I couldn't do it. So I would just do air drum, you know, pretend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember we would do that. Well, so. I, did, I do that sometimes. Did you? Mm -hmm. And you can, I can feel that though, too. You can feel that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing and keep it up. <laughs> um, wonderful. Thank you. So, yeah. So Lama Tsultrim found that that some Westerners were were getting it, were grokking it, and were benefiting from it. And a lot of people did at various levels. But she also could tell that it was you know because you chant it, you learn it in Tibetan language, and it's a foreign ritual. It's harder to really make it personal unless you understand Tibetan or you kind of read the English a lot and then and then when you're doing the Tibetan prayers you understand where you are and the whole arc of the practice. So over time she began to develop a more kind of westernized approach to this Chud practice and spoke with, conferred with some close colleagues and friends of hers who are you know psychologists, psychiatrists, um, lic licensed family therapists and so on, people who work with individuals and their individual uh, so-called demons. And what she found was that the empty chair therapeutic method that was really pioneered by people like Gestalt, Fritz Perl, and so on, was really effective and had, in a sense, a similar thrust or Gestalt to Chut. And so she adapted. She kind of, she wove them together and created this practice called feeding your demons she chose to call it that we call we shorten it with the acronym fyd which kind of sounds like feed <laughs> if you say that which i like i think it's cool because sometimes with feeding your demons people are like what i don't want to do that that's terrifying other people are like that sounds cool let's do it so fyd um feeding your demons and 
So I'll guide you through this. I'll invite you to kind of get ready. You could have, if you have a journal or a piece of paper with pen or pencil nearby, that's really nice, but you don't need to. I usually give time at the end for you to journal. So you could be doing that as I'm talking right now if you want to. And then what we'll also do is I'll invite you to have an empty seat in front of you so that you can switch positions and take that empty chair, whether it's a cushion or a pillow or another chair. Um, everybody should have enough space to have their original seat that they start in and then have an empty seat right in front of them. So people in the room, you could spread out or if you're home, uh, make sure you have that. And if you're in a tight situation where you can't have two chairs, when I tell you to switch, you could just stand up and turn around, face your original seat in a standing position. So that's also a possibility. It's really important to change positions. There's something about the, the change of directions that you feel when you switch positions that really helps embody the whole process. It's, it's, there's a name for that in this world of psychology and it's not coming to me right now, but it's a thing. So don't think, oh, it's okay, I'm fine, I don't have to get up. If you can, get up. Now, of course, if you can't, that's okay too. Sometimes, like I've done feeding your demons in bed, when it, maybe I can't fall asleep at night, uh, for example. I haven't, that hasn't happened lately, but I remember I went through a period where that was happening. And so what I would do is I would lie on one side and start the five steps and then when it came time to switch positions I would just roll over and lie on my other side <laughs> and it created that kind of spatial orientation shift that let me feel like okay now I'm taking the seat of the demon you know or later in the process now I'm taking the seat of the ally so that which we resist persists and so often people are like well if I feed a demon won't it get bigger and that's a common assumption that actually isn't true because that which we resist persists. If you're resisting something, like say you're resisting the fact that you don't feel worthy enough for love, you're unworthy to receive love, but you, you're ashamed that you have that feeling or you don't like that feeling, so you try to push it away or ignore it. It sort of just stays there in the corner of the room or in the corner of your psyche and through the resistance it kind of gets a little bit you know a little bit more enlivened because it's it's being oxygenated through the self-doubt that's perpetually there that you haven't healed yet right so in a sense it's kind of you don't think you're you're feeding in the, the the other sense of the word but you kind of are by resisting it but when you finally in a safe space which i want to create here in our cosmic web of safe space together when you enter into it consciously with a guide um, and you 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 designate okay I am here and I am going to work with my self-loathing for once and for all because I want to find out what's there and it's that turning towards it that can help shift the resistance dynamic that actually, in a sense, gives a little bit more space and also permission for that aspect of yourself to express itself. And especially because I'll give you the chance to ask it some questions and then switch positions and actually become it and answer those questions as the so-called demon. So then it, you give it voice. And various different things can happen, but very often what happens is you realize, oh, it's not such a big, bad, ugly monster. It's not such a terror. It's not going to devour me or it's not so difficult to work with, actually. It just has a message to give me. It needs to say something and it hasn't been able to do that. I haven't given it the space. It never felt safe enough, maybe. Or maybe it just wasn't the right time yet, you know. There's timing. Timing is important for all of this, and it's important not to rupture or push anything. And so, likewise, later in the process with step four, we meet the uh, ally. Step four is feeding the demon, and then you meet the ally. So when the demon is fed to complete satisfaction, we feed it nectar. We feed, we feed, we feed. And then that through that process of in a sense, it's like metta, loving kindness practice, where you're offering it what it needs to heal through the form of nectar. 
And then you watch the so-called demon in your mind's eye, your imagination. You're, you're feeding it in your imagination. You're watching it in your imagination, shifting and changing. And it, it can either dissolve completely. It can either shift into the ally immediately. Or maybe it changes shape, but it just slinks off into the corner. At a certain point, I'll say now, if it's not your ally, if the being that remains is not your ally, invite an ally to appear. And so you take a moment to open to it, invite an ally, and then see what comes. You'll notice the details of the ally. You'll ask us some questions that I'll give you. And then you'll get to change positions and embody the ally. Really become it and feel what it's like to become the ally. And when I say ally, it's the, it's the uh, kind of common use of the word in terms of somebody who's got your back, somebody who is here to help, uh, a mentor, a spirit guide, a guardian angel, a Buddha, a bodhisattva. You see, it can be anything. It can be a butterfly. It can be an older version of yourself it, or a younger version of yourself. It could be really it could be anything. It could be a sunflower that sprouts a face and some arms and wants to talk to you. <laughs> it can really be anything. There's no rules here. And um, one of my friends who I used to work with, uh, she's an art teacher. We do Feeding Your Demons courses together. And I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one with her when, when she was in the early days. She was getting to know the process and really benefiting a lot from it. And once she had an owl as her ally, so we called it the owl eye, <laughs> the owl eye. <laughs> which was pretty cool and she drew a really neat picture of it I'll try to find it someday and share it maybe on one of the Instagram posts for SFDC so um, I think you know I could talk for a whole hour about feeding your demons but nothing does it service better than just doing it so let's go ahead and do it and I will walk you through it you can close your eyes, keep them closed throughout the whole process, or if you feel more comfortable with the eyes slightly open, you can do that as well. The idea is to turn off your notifications, close your door, tell your family or friends that you're going to be quiet for about another hour, and uh, claim your space. You deserve it. And let's go on the journey together. And the people who are online, what I'd like to say is if you can be in profile with the Zoom camera. So like I, I might start in this profile and then when it comes time to change positions then I could turn, my chair will do it, <laughs> and be in the other profile. That's just a way for me to gauge what's going on in the room. You know, I, it's nice to see you. And of course, if you need to be on no camera, I understand. That's fine too. It's all your choice. I like to be liberal with that permission. So do what you need to do. And I see the people in the room are ready. So let's go ahead and get started. Allow the eyes to close or be a little open if you prefer. Keep them closed as much as possible until the end of the process. Let's begin with some relaxation breaths. So we'll take some deep abdominal breaths for the first few breaths. Breathe into any physical tension you're holding in your body. And then hooking that tension with the breath, release it with the out breath. Releasing physical tension as much as possible with the out breath. And don't worry, you're gonna have plenty of time to think about what you'd like to work with tonight. I'll give you a few minutes in silence to land on that. So we're just relaxing into this space now. And then for the next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension you're holding. And notice where you hold emotional tension in your body, hooking that tension with the in-breath and then release it with the out breath. Mm -hmm. 
And for the last few breaths, breathe into any mental tension. Feel where you may hold mental tension in your body, worries, concerns. Hooking that tension with the in-breath and then release it with the out-breath. And now take a moment to generate a heartfelt motivation to practice for the benefit of yourself and all others. And now take some time to let the mind roam a bit internally, feel what you might want to work with tonight. Maybe you came already knowing what you'd like to work with. Or maybe you have a few options waiting in the sidelines. Just feel into what feels the most at the surface right now. What's the most up? Maybe you had a conflict at work or with a friend recently, maybe it's a deep-seated ongoing issue, maybe physical pain or illness or emotional challenges, or maybe it's sort of just like a existential itch or a feeling of dissatisfaction. Maybe you're working with an addiction. Maybe you're trying to quit smoking or drinking and so on. You can also work with that with feeding your demons. We'll sit in silence for a minute or two, landing on one particular thing. And then when you've landed or decided on what you'd like to work with, think about it and perhaps remember a particular time or incident when it came up strongly. And then scan your body and locate where you're holding this so-called demon, this challenge, this obstacle in your body. Where do you feel it most strongly in your body? And after you've noticed where this feeling is held most strongly in your body, this block, this challenge, this issue, then notice its shape.
Notice its color. What is its texture? Smooth, jagged, spiky, or furry? What is the texture of this feeling in your body? And what is its temperature? Hot, cold, warm, neutral? Now for a moment, intensify this feeling. And now allow this feeling, the sensation, color, texture, temperature, to move out of your body and become personified in front of you as a being with limbs, a face, eyes, and so on. It can be helpful to take a gesture with your hands, your arms, of moving the energy out of the body, allowing it to manifest personified in front of you. Notice what you see. If an inanimate object appears, like a rock or a tree, then imagine what it would look like if it were personified as a being with a face, limbs, and so on. Because we're going to dialogue with it. What would it look like if it were personified? Notice its size. Notice its color. Notice the texture of its skin. Does it have a gender? What is its character? Do 
What is its emotional state? What is the look in its eyes? If it doesn't have eyes, you can do the subjunctive tool, which is the what if. If it did have eyes, what would it look like? And now notice something about this so-called demon that you didn't see before. Now, you're going to ask this demon three questions. I'll give them to you one by one and repeat after me out loud, not waiting for the answer because you'll switch positions afterwards and answer from the demon's point of view. Ask following me out loud. What do you want? What do you really need? How will you feel when you get what you really need? And then slowly switching places now, keeping your eyes as closed as much as possible. Taking the seat or the stance of the demon Take a moment now to settle into the demon's body and feel what it's like to be the demon. Notice how it feels to be in the demon's body. You can take a gesture, a stance if you want. The demon's standing, you can stand up. An expression. Feel free to really embody the demon. And then notice how your normal self looks from the demon's point of view. And now answer the questions, speaking as the demon. I'll give you the beginning of the phrase, and you can repeat that beginning and complete the sentence in full, speaking as the demon. What I want is...
what I really need is. This is the need beneath the want, a deeper need. What I really need is. And when I get what I really need, I will feel. When I get what I really need, I will feel. What is the feeling tone you'll have when you get what you really need as the demon? And take note of the answer to this question. What is that feeling a demon would have when it got what it really needed? Freedom, healing, wholeness, love, whatever that is, take note. And then when you're ready, return now to your original seat. And take a moment to settle back into your own body now. And see the demon opposite you. And now either dissolve your body into nectar or feel free to just imagine that you create an infinite supply of nectar. This nectar has the quality of the feeling that the demon would have when it gets what it really needs. So that answer to the third question. So either dissolving your body into nectar or simply imagining that you're creating an infinite supply of body of nectar from your body or from the environment. It could be rain falling down, it could be a big pool of nectar, it could be ice cream, it could be light coming from your heart. Just trust your imagination here and imagine that this nectar flows from you to the demon and you feed the demon until complete satisfaction. And notice the color of the nectar. As you feed the demon this nectar, notice how the demon takes it in. you're resisting feeding it, just it can be helpful to think, well, resisting it hasn't really worked until now. Why don't I try something new? Let's feed it. Feed it that deep, deep feeling that it would have when it got what it really needed in the form of nectar. Just see what happens.
Just feeding the nectar to complete satisfaction. Take your time here. Make a flow of nectar from you to the demon, feeding to complete satisfaction. If the demon seems insatiable, you can imagine how it would look if it were completely satisfied. Now notice if there is a being present after the demon is satisfied completely. If there is a being present in place of the demon, ask this being if it is the ally. If it's not, then invite an ally to appear. Also, if there is no being present, After the feeding the demon to complete satisfaction is complete, then invite an ally to appear. And when you see the ally, notice all the details of the ally. Notice its size. Notice its color. Notice the texture of its skin. Its density. Is it effervescent? Is it like a human or a light body? And notice if it has a gender. What is its character? What is her emotional state, or the ally's emotional state? What 
What is the look in their eye? And now notice something about the ally that you haven't noticed before. And now ask the ally some questions like before. I'll give you the question and you can repeat after me one by one. How will you help me? How will you protect me? What pledge do you make to me? And how can I access you? Then, uh, having asked the questions now again, keeping the eyes closed as much as possible, switch positions and become the ally. Feel free to take a moment to settle into the ally's body. You may wish to take a gesture or an expression that helps you embody the energy of the ally. And feel what it's like to be in the ally's body. And then notice how your normal self looks from the ally's point of view. Now, as the ally speaking, answering these questions, I'll give you the beginning and you can repeat the beginning and then complete in a full sentence. Now, if you're in a room with other people, you can do this silently under your breath. If you're alone in your room, you can say it out loud. Speaking as the ally, I will help you by... I will protect you by... I pledge I will.
And you can access me by And then when you're ready, I'll return to your original seat. Take a moment to settle back into your body. See the ally in front of you again. And look into the ally's eyes and feel its energy pouring into you, streaming into you like the sunlight on your skin, your energy filling every pore of your body. As you feel it coming into your body, it spreads all the way down, down from the crown, down through the body down to the soles of the feet, down the arms into the hands. The energy of the ally is filling your body. And then the ally dissolves blissfully into radiant light. And that light then dissolves into you and feel that you're integrating the energy of the ally in your body, every cell of your being. And notice the feeling of the integrated energy of the ally in your body. And then you, along with the energy of the ally, also dissolve into vast, open, luminous space. And rest in that presence, that quality of awareness unbound by the physical form. Rest in awareness, free of activity, free of grasping free of distraction. Just rest for a few moments here together.
Now let's gradually come back, come back to your body, feel your body and the space around you, feel the seat beneath you, clothes upon your skin. Feel the breath in the body coming back to your body. But also recall the energy of the ally in your body. Feel that still present. And as you open your eyes, now slowly coming into the space wherever you are and feel your body, but yet also integrated with that ally energy so that you don't lose it as soon as you open your eyes. Feel it in your body. And now let's take some time, about eight minutes or so, to journal. So if you don't have journal or you don't want to journal, You can also meditate, keep meditating, resting in awareness. You can go back to that, resting in meditative awareness. It's up to you. Free flow with the journal, whatever you remember, or if you know the steps and you want to record each uh, step as your process unfolded, you can do it in that structure as well. Just free flow. What did the demon say? What did the ally say? What was the figure that came to you?
Okay, so let's slowly start to come back. Jot down any final notes or impressions, insights you'd like to record. Oh, I found it. <laughs> I was looking for the owl, and literally I thought I couldn't find it. And I looked down, and there it is. So I want to show it to you. I show it. Maybe I'll text it to me. Oh, for some reason I can't share it. So let's come back. I might just try to show it on my phone. It's saved in maybe iCloud, but as we're coming back, I'm gonna just show you this picture of my friend's owl. Isn't that cool? You see it? Look at up close. It's all black ink. Isn't that awesome? She's an artist, so don't feel bad. You know, like most of us might not be able to do that. Look at those feathers. So that was Jen Burke, who I do creative liberation. We call it creative liberation. It's art and feeding your demons uh, classes that we used to do a lot. And she's such a cool art teacher. She won awards here in Berkeley for her art education for kids. and uh, But she loves teaching adults, too. And now she lives in Mexico. <laughs> but uh, she would often take the imagery that came up in Feeding Your Demons and then use that as a springboard to create more art. Just you know, So you might have noticed that, that you got images coming up that were maybe blurry, maybe not so defined. Or maybe they were really funny or really kind of clear and surprising sometimes. So if you want to, no pressure, but we've got five minutes. Does anybody want to kind of unmute and share what um, you could even talk about? You don't have to tell us like if it's personal and you don't want to share your psychology. You can just talk about the imagery that came up. You know, oh, I got a dog and then I got a angel and this is what it meant to me and you know you can talk about it in ways that aren't too personal if you don't want to so please go ahead unmute or raise your hand Geneva um, my ally was a cat and the cat it was a question so how would that ally, um, you know, communicate with me to? And my cat turned into the cartoon character Top Cat, and got two garbage can lids and started banging them together to get my attention. It was pretty cool. At the same moment, my cat started tearing at the door under the carpet, trying to get in my room, <laughs> responding to like my future demons with the cat coming to help. But it's like, okay, <laughs> pretty interesting interview. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen Top Cat in years, but I have a feeling I'm going to be seeing a lot more Top Cat. Uh -huh. It was pretty fun. That's great. But thank you. I also wanted to thank you for some of your imagery that you offer. It really helps me clarify a lot of things. And then the Tong Lin that you did a couple of weeks ago, that yeah. was amazing for what it's done with my meditation. Thank okay. you. Great, great. Yeah, Thank and those, all of these classes are recorded and on the SFDC YouTube channel. So if something happens that you like, a little stroke of magic, you know, and it lights you up, you can come back and steep in it more. Thank you, Geneva. That's great. Appreciate your sharing. I love hearing the feedback. It's helpful for me. I, I could show you something. I mean, I, I don't mean to overshare, but I looked down on the script and I realized, oh, I have a drawing from the last time I did Feeding Your Demons with art. I just sketched it. This was a, a, a it's my demon. It was a drone bat. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It's a drone bat. And then my my ally was a little, like a black raven on my shoulder. You see, that's me with the round head and then the raven on my shoulder. So that was fun to see. 
I forgot I did that. Go ahead. Who's next? Maybe one or two more? How was that? Maybe if it was new for you, you know, how was that? Okay, we've got somebody in the room. Tracy, is that really red light or is that a filter that you've got on your camera? I think I've seen that before. It's pretty cool. I like it. Trace or Tracy? Yeah, this is this is authentic. This is nice. emanating. Cool. Yes, thanks. Fun. Okay, Karen, did you want to, Cage, did you want to offer somebody some mic time? Uh, I don't know if you can see me over here, but this is Jimmy. And Hi, we can hear you though. My my demon was a rooster <laughs> that was very faint. My my capacity for visualization is really really low, and this practice is always challenging for me because of that. Yeah. But I I I come here to do it sort of because of that, and and it's 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 always been very profound. So anyway, it was a rooster and it came faintly and sort of flickered in and out, but it was, um, it, it, it fed sort of through osmosis, this really beautiful yellow light kind of nectar that sort of just soaked through its feathers. And the oh. ally was really clear. It was a life ring that came in the center of my vision and just dropped down into the chair and sort of propped up against there. And it was really clear. Mm. You know, the, the, that classic life ring circle with the with the, the rope attached to it. And, and it was, that was very clear. That was very interesting to me mm. to have that, 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 the clarity of that vision. Mm -hmm. so th thanks once again, Chandra. This was, um, mm -hmm. it was, it was good. Yes. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Jimmy. We could just take one more if there's somebody else. We are at time, but if it's you know, I just had a real quick comment. Yeah, Bill. Hi. Um, it's great, great to see you. And great to um, see you too. <clears throat> it's just amazing to me that when we sort of take off the harness of our imagination and let it go, that you know, um, there's really no limit or no boundary about what can 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 come up. Because when I've done this practice before, I'm just amazed at. Uh, uh, the imagination that unfolds and um it's like there like i said there's there's no limit to it, it it's like i can't believe my little logical mind that you know is very methodical can have mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. this wonderful um experience that's really just from my imagination and it's um thanks for helping me unleash it it's yes. always always very fruitful to 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 go there Thank you. Yes. Unleash it. I like that image. Taking the leash off. Take the lid off. <laughs> Take the leash off. And soar in that imagination. In the, not, yeah, the imaginary space. Um, it's true. There's no limit to the imagination. You know, we can really be daring or more vulnerable than we could if we were literally having to do certain things. That's the Tonglen is like that too, isn't it, Bill? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, I might not want to give love to my enemy, but I can do that here in this safe space because it's visualizing and it's more of a prayer and it's not literal. But it's true, the sky's the limit with these growing in these expansive ways and trusting the imagery that comes up has been a big lesson for me. Often we say first thought, best thought, but then I footnote that with well first thought can morph into next thought you know it's like if you get an image okay go with it maybe you need to follow it down the path a little bit more maybe it wants to shift and transform to really land on what that is yeah. sometimes you'll see something and you'll be like what 
No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like my demon tonight was a balloon with a face, like with those funny glove hands. I was like, what? <laughs> but it worked, you know? Yeah. And I had a good ally. Yeah. So when you trust, there's a flow that happens, and then the ally seems more ready to appear too. Um, and if, if for, I can end on this note, and did, was there something else you wanted to say, Bill? No, that's, that's no? all. Okay, thank great. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, what was my last thought? <laughs> I just forgot. <laughs> uh, yes. If you have a hard time visualizing, if you're self-critical, if you think you can't do things well and it's never good enough, that's a demon. Take that as your demon. Feel that in your body. Give it form. Dialogue with it. Become it. Learn from it. Where? Why was it there? Maybe it was there for a good reason when you were younger, but now you don't need it anymore. Take it off like an old jacket. Take the leash off. <laughs> That'll be our motto. Take the leash off. Let your imagination roam. We all, you know, miracles happen in certain ways. They can be small ones, but they're miracles. Here's a funny miracle, just because I've got the mic. <laughs> um, and I'm a lonely writer who's stuck in my house all the time. I had the funniest experience. And this is like an example of serendipity or whatever. I was playing music with a couple friends. And we were talking about our favorite songs. And I had, I had just rediscovered a beautiful, I think it's a Spanish song in, in Spanish. Um, about Paloma. I can't remember the whole title. It's a very classical kind of culture song, cultural song, but it just stole my heart away. So we're talking about it. And, you know, Paloma means dove, right? Literally, right after I said that, and we were listening to it on Spotify, and we were talking about how beautiful the melodies were, my cat, who is a hunter, I have to admit, and I feel a little guilty about that. Usually she gets rats. But at, right after we stopped playing the song, she comes in through the courtyard into the living room, meowing with something in her mouth. And then she puts it down right in front of me, and it's a baby dove that she f didn't eat. Maybe she punctured a wing there. I could see a little blood, but it was still alive. Um, like before, it was still a fledgling. We had to look up online to see what it was, and we realized it's a, we found out it's a dove. So I wound up having to take it to the wildlife refu refu um, rescue place in Walnut Creek with my little dove, and I listened to the Paloma song the whole way there. But like these are little miracles. Can't explain it. Maybe I don't even want to understand how that stuff happens, but uh, it does. So watch out for those little miracles in your life. And in Tibetan, they say that follow those signs. You know, what are those signs? The tendril is the word. I talk about this a lot in class because I love this principle. Often the lamas will gauge their life, make decisions to go one way or the other, or to receive this student or another based on the tendril, the interdependent links, the signs that show up in our life so that we follow and we're living with the Tao, you know, in the flow. And when these magic things happen, in a way, it's like affirmation that there's something there, you know. What is that? Follow it. Om. <laughs> so, thank you, everybody. I believe I'm with you again next week. Oh, this is, I was going to announce this at the beginning. If, I think Eve announced this last class, too, did she? Our book that we've chosen, she didn't announce it yet. Okay, great. You'll have time. You know, we'll start slow. This is a really great book on Tibetan healing. It's called Boundless Healing. It has wonderful practices and meditations in it. So we'll really get to engage in the practice. Boundless Healing by Tolku Tundup. Tolku Tundup. I'll put this in the chat. Boundless Healing by Tolku Tundup. He is a really important teacher in the lineage that I and Eve steep in the Dzogchen lineage, the Nyingma, the elders within Tibetan Buddhism. And it's very accessible for modern people, but then also these meditations are very profound and beautiful. So we'll read this together. This is our next book study. So between now and next week, if you can, order it, get it at your local bookstore, if you can find it. And um, But know that we'll still come if you want just to hear about it. If you haven't 
gotten it or you're behind on the reading, it doesn't matter. Just come and show up and we'll steep in this for however long it takes to finish the book. Any questions, comments about that? We could put that on the on the YouTube, right? On the YouTube. Great. Thanks, Noah. Thanks, everybody. Karen and everybody who show up in person. Mace, I wish I could be there. I look forward to coming there sometime soon. I'll be probably online until I finish my book by the end of October. That is my commitment. Two Taras a day. <laughs> will get me there. Editing, editing. It's 21 Taras. I'm excited to talk about my book at some point a little bit more and, and teach on it. Okay. Ciao. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Be well. Thank you.